everybody, and welcome to this month's edition of Ham Talk. First of all, we must always thank our sponsors, the Hamsters Week Signal Group. Without them, this podcast wouldn't exist. So thank you so much to them for such great support. And of course, Greg, our poor guy that, you know, is the one that is the vocal mouthpiece of their group. Here he is. <laughs> All right. My name is Sam Henley. If you haven't joined us before, welcome. My call sign is KE0LMY. This is Melissa. Hi, everybody. KI5ICQ. Andrea. Hello, Andrea Slack, K2EZ. And you know that guy. <laughs> The Fat Man, N5XO. <laughs> we were thinking about using other names for the show, but apparently they're already trademarked, so we can't use those. But, you know, we've got some really cute ones. Maybe Greg will send it out through the group or something. And if you pay attention to his group on Facebook or something, maybe he'll make a little post on the alternate names for the Ham Talk podcast. <laughs> I'm setting you up, Greg. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. You know, so I, I was got, looking for something else to do. We've got some really <laughs> awesome segments for you this month. We're finally giving Andrea a break because she has been towing the line for me because I have been nonstop busy for the last six months. I finally have a deputy director at Camden County Emergency Management. So hopefully my load will lighten up a little bit and I can get back to doing some of the fun stuff and bring you guys some information. Greg, your segment this month is going to be about what? We are actually, my segment's going to run the next six months. Uh, and what we're covering is VHF, UHF station building. And we're going to start at the antenna and we're going to work our way down and we're going to do it by bands because different bands have some different specialties and requirements. So we're going to start at two meters and we actually included 1.25 meters in this month with two because they're very similar. And then we'll do 432 and 1296 and uh, everything. So uh, I hope everybody enjoys it and uh, we'll see how it goes. And then Melissa's got some questions, I think, for us this month. So we're going to cover some of those. And then I have a, a short segment where we had one of our viewers ask us a couple of questions. Hopefully the two topics that I cover in mine, which is how to deal with outgoing emergency coordinators and whether there's a rub, as well as dealing with a rub between amateur radio and emergency management hopefully that'll help you guys a little bit with advice that I can give from both sides of the fence, because luckily at this point, I've been on both sides of the fence. So <laughs> I can see the problems and I understand the, the miscommunication and the issues that can happen in there. I'm super excited because if you guys look, look at this, this is all of the videos I'm going to shoot this year to send to Greg to include. So Andrea will get to take a break for a little while. <laughs> No, nah, don't don't get your hopes up, Andy. <laughs> Shut up, Greg. <laughs> so I didn't I mean it that way, but <laughs> I think that we're going to probably start with some questions from Melissa. So, Melissa, do you have some questions ready for us? Sure, let's go. All right. Um, I think this might key in with um, what Greg is has been doing here. So Greg, KC1FGY is looking for some info on hor horizontally stacking two M2, 2M12 antennas, specifically regarding stacking length and coax length. Thanks. Okay. I actually am not going to answer that question right this minute because we covered my segment uh in great detail so uh stand by and when we <laughs> roll into my segment we'll cover it and we'll answer that question for you okay awesome um i also have a comment mike mcdonald says man oh man you really fancied up the intro i just found this three weeks later but glad i did wish y'all were more consistent i almost forgot about you 
I guess it's just too long between episodes is what I'm saying. I understand it's a lot of work though. So. Yeah, well now. And that it is. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, let me tackle that one because I hardly ever get to tackle a question. Okay, everybody, <laughs> to tell you the tr truth, it's because Sam has so damn much on, I mean, <laughs> so much <laughs> on her plate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but honestly, it is a lot of work and with, th you know, at least me in a different state, it does sometimes come down to scheduling issues. Uh, a lot of the time, especially, I'm sorry for me, is with us going into either a winter season or a spring season, it's bad with the weather. Here in Missouri, we've been just hit with all kinds of snowstorms this year and hit in spring, of course, with the rains and the melting from the winter. It's going to be a pain. We are really trying to get on a more consistent schedule. The other thing that holds us up is if we're each shooting our individual segments, we have to get those to Greg and then he has to have time to cut them together or <laughs> eliminate when one of us messes up. <laughs> and he has to go through and make us all look good and sound good. And as much grief as we give him, he is actually the one that carries all of the effort for putting this on. So look at, look at him soaking that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's because normally I'm giving him grief. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I'm going to give kudos to one person in here real quick. Melissa finally got on the air. Yeah, I'm, I got my antenna up and yep. So as for consistency, we are really trying our best. Again, with a startup, when you are literally just starting up any kind of YouTube channel or starting up any kind of podcast, there's a lot of kinks to work through. I know Greg's improvement on the opening segment is due to software that he's gotten. So he's learning new software, doing a fantastic job, in my opinion, because it does. It looks like a movie trailer or something and it's a lot of working the kinks out trying to figure out what does work and what doesn't if our sound isn't that great do we need to get new microphones and it's all very very startup so we thank you guys that are sticking with us through these bumps and bruises of learning how to do this we're not the big money episodes <laughs> from big name ham radio podcasts i'm sure you know which ones i'm talking about <laughs> So <laughs> we're right. not them, but, you know, as for the down home, just we enjoy what we're doing and the different things that we can bring to it. Andrea brings so much knowledge about the roving and about all of the stuff that she gets into and the contesting and everything else. And Melissa being brand new, you guys who are brand new to ham radio yeah. and part of what you're doing is watching us through all of these bumps and bruises. It helps to show that we're human and we're doing the absolute best we can. Greg, like I said, he's the one really, we do, we give him a lot of grief. We really, really do. I, I'm the number one that gives him the grief, but he really does do all of the heavy lifting. So a lot of it is the fact that you guys stick with us i know you forget about us click on that subscribe button i hate to be that typical youtube video that does this but i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it right now <laughs> click on that subscribe button hit the bell for the notifications so that you know when we post a new video and we might start working on a little something else a little something extra maybe a behind the scenes or something like that that way in between the shows you're getting to see some of the hard work that goes into what we do <laughs> Yeah, that? And, and one thing I, <laughs> I will say, we try to go and release it around the 15th of each month, but December, January kind of kicked us in the butt. Uh, Sam had like disaster after disaster in her county for emergency management. Andrea was in the process of breaking everything that she touched on her body. Uh, and Melissa the car and her. Thick. Uh, we had COVID go through our family finally. So, I mean, it just, it was the perfect storm. Yeah. And then we had a few other things to follow up plus regular work. So 
uh, December and January were really hard on our schedule, but I think we're back on a good track. This one will be released on or before the 15th and uh, celebration of my birthday and uh, everything. So gifts are appreciated. Feel free to send them. Uh, donations, donations. Yeah, I was going to say, I, we give you the gift of our presence. So, you know. God knows. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Melissa? Yes. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I, you know, there, I just, I had some thoughts on, you know, his comments about, you know, being more consistent and too long between episodes. And it's exactly that <clears throat> we have several households here and everybody's working a different schedule and, you know, a wrench gets thrown in the works and, you know, somebody can't record until a certain day and somebody can't edit their stuff until, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, before you know it, it's the end of the month. So anyway, you know, but so we're, we're, we're trying. We, we we're trying. hope to have, I actually have recorded four segments already. So mine are ready to just pop in for each show uh, for the next four months, at least. Uh, now, right. Sam and Andrea, well, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. She's got a list. Oh, my I goodness. Have a list. All right. Well, let's okay. go to your other question. All right. Um, Laura has a, a, a situation question here. Um, she says, I've been told that on my truck, I should not use a vertical antenna for two meters sideband. I only have one output for VHF, UHF, and have a dual band antenna that works great. So why do I need to put up a horizontal antenna and how do I go about it? Go ahead, Andrea. <laughs> We've got to give you something to do today. Oh, yeah, I can say a few <laughs> words here. Uh, the reason you want to have a horizontally polarized for single sideband is most operators, most serious operators are running horizontal polarized. There are some people that use vertically polarized on single sideband, tend to be very local nets and such. So um, being cross polarized puts you at a significant disadvantage uh, when you're trying to run single sideband. You're, you're already at a disadvantage being in a mobile compared to most of the fixed stations, which have higher antennas, probably a Yagi, and you're not using a repeater when you're operating on single sideband. So you need to get as much signal out as you can. So um, the challenge that I, I understand in the question is, well, you're using the same radio probably for FM as single sideband, and you've got a dual band, vertically polarized antenna, which works for those needs. And now for sideband, you've got, you know, how, how do you make that work when you switch to sideband with only one output connector? And the only thing that comes to mind really on that is you can, run sideband compromise, but you're probably not going to work too much with it um, to and, and compromise by running that vertical antenna. To run horizontal, you need to get a switch probably to switch to the horizontal antenna. That's what I use on my two meter, of course, I've invested a lot in my mobile, but I have three antennas. Uh, stacked horizontal omnis. I've got the Yagi, okay? Not many people carry Yagis on their mobile. <laughs> and then I've got a vertical and polarized antenna and I can switch to any of those antennas for depending upon what I am doing. Um, as for antenna, there's a, a number of horizontally polarized antennas Again, mounting tends to be a little trickier because you have to elevate the antenna. Uh, M squared has um, a system for that. 
with a large magnet. It can also get mounted other places on a truck and a bed. A lot of people running horizontally polarized, you'll see them running some twine, some uh, very light rope to the front corners of their, their hood to act as guy wires for that rather large antenna. So there's, there's a few challenges there. And uh, but I hope I've given some idea of how you can handle that with different connectors. I, I will say in, in practice, unless you've got a lot of uh, local activity on sideband, you're probably not going to find too much. And I, while I'd like to encourage people getting into that, you're probably going to find more on FM um even 146.52 simplex then then on sideband except during those those uh contest periods of time or no nets that you know some places have nets on sideband during a contest if you're doing roving you're probably going to make that effort to get a horizontally polarized antenna though yeah um something that i did just to simplify it I've put a lighted toggle switch in a uh, on off on uh, toggle and I've got a coaxial relay mounted on underneath the antennas on my sport bar on the back of my truck. So one cable feed comes from the radio, hits the coaxial relay and then I just flip the toggle switch that's flushed into the dash and I can switch from horizontal to vertical that way <clears throat> or you could just put an old-fashioned mechanical uh antenna switch in which is going to look kind of ugly in the car but you know it just depends on your taste <laughs> that's what are that, we that, about that how horizontal <laughs> polarized loop antenna uh, hanging above the car nobody's going to notice that right well, I know, it's but I am. I no, no, they're gonna be worried how about that switch and, and how it looks. <laughs> I am. <laughs> it drives me nuts if things don't look factory. Uh, yeah. on that. It took me a long time to fit, to mount a nine my ninety seven hundred in the truck, so that uh, I could do it without it standing out, and I finally found how to do that. So. And let me tell you, base station in your truck for a mobile is is offer some challenges. It does it that. I've I've used coaxials, which I use a whole bunch of coaxial relays, but I'm switching a lot of different bands and 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 that. But my earlier setups, I just got a basic two pole switch, and I, I wasn't trying to do three way at the time. And positioning of that, you can put it on the one side of the console, far, far side of the console, you come out of the radio, depending upon what kind of radio, whether you have a separate control head or the whole radio. Um, but if the radio is up front, you just come out with a short segment to that switch, you kind of put on one side of the console, uh, passenger side. And you can reach over and flip that switch to one position or the other. And you run it off to two antennas. Yeah. Cool. Hopefully that answered his question or her question, I guess. Right. Okay. We have another question from Jeff. And this question is not for Andrea or Greg. It is for Andrea and Greg both. And... Sam, if you, have any, if you want to chime in, let's, let's do that. Okay. Um, question. The question is, what is the longest contact you have made on two meters, FM or SSB? Ladies first. Oh, I was going to let you take it, Greg. All right. My longest contact would be, oh, gosh. It's one of two contact, either Texas, Texas to, to Michigan or Texas to southeastern Florida. Uh, the Texas to Michigan was 1,100 miles, and the Texas to southeast Florida was either 1040 miles or 1140 miles. That's why I'm not sure uh, which it was. 
Um, there were a number of other contacts I've had in Florida. Uh, the Florida contacts were all um, tropospheric propagation when conditions were really good. Uh, ducting was very likely going on. Uh, the Michigan contact was an ESKIP contact. And so signals were really strong up, up into to Michigan. Uh, let's see. I think mine on FM uh, simplex 146.52 was during a big tropo opening. Uh, and it was Florida from San Antonio, Texas to Florida on two meter uh, FM. On single sideband, my record contact has held for seven years now. I haven't been able to beat it yet. Uh, and I work Belize. Whoa. And, <laughs> yeah, that okay, was- Okay, I can't that beat was, that. <laughs> I don't care what- yeah, that, that was uh, my record that. contact. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, I finished that contact and I had a QSL card in the mail before the microphone cooled off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he gave it back to me. Uh, he sent the QSL back because he was just as excited as I was. But that was my record contact. And we had some phenomenal leaf skip and stuff going on. Uh, other than that, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina are my long range contacts on sideband. Yeah, from, from here in Texas, the, since you do get much warmer temperatures here, there's a lot more enhanced tropo than, than up in New Jersey when I'm up there. And like Greg has said, from, from here, I've worked Arkansas, Tennessee, um, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, mm -hmm. Um, South Carolina, North Carolina, um, and also Florida, like I mentioned. Um, from up north in Pennsylvania, I've worked uh, Missouri, 775 miles, tropospheric. And I, what, what I remember most about that contact was the station was incredibly weak. I mean, I understood every word the person said first time, but they were the faintest whisper. And I only spotted them when I heard somebody else working them, but they heard me come back first time and I, I worked them, I was on a hilltop. Um, prior to that, I had one from Tennessee to um, K5TR in Texas, which was about 750 miles e-skip. I worked them in one contact. And then later in a contest, I worked them on Tropo, um, a rather short distance, probably 200 miles or something like that. And he, he did a double take and came back. Uh, and said, you know, wanted to confirm the grid because he had previously worked me in the grid near Nashville. And now I was south of Dallas in the same, on the same day. Um, so uh, I had she moved moves, people, she moves. <laughs> All right, we got any more questions, Melissa? That, that, that's it for this month. Awesome. awesome. All right. So here is where we will go into Greg's segment. All right. It is my sincere hope that you guys have as much fun and enjoyment out of my segments uh, for the next uh, four, five, six months as I am in putting them together. We're going to be building a VHF, UHF, weak signal, single sideband, and or a FM simplex station, depending on, on your particular interest and needs. We'll be designing the stations covering from two meters through 23 centimeters. Typically, I would not make brand recommendations, but 
Because we are aiming for specific parts and design recommendations in this series, we will be focusing on different models of antennas, amps, preamps, switches, radios, et cetera, okay? I will be making personalized, uh, my opinion only, uh, brand and specific product recommendations for our station build. If you follow our design and build and you, the way we're laying it out, you're going to greatly enjoy solid communications on FM simplex or single sideband operation. Once you start using simplex and avoid repeaters as a rule, you're gonna be shocked at how much satisfaction you can gain from accomplishing contacts without the aid of repeaters, internet and such, you know? Uh, because techniques, requirements and radios are different as we work our way up the bands, we're gonna focus our station build by bands, okay? So with our first segment uh, starting today, we're gonna to be devoted to two meters and 1.25 meters as they're very similar in operation and very similar in requirements, antenna design sizes, et cetera. The old saying that the ham with a $10,000 radio and a $10 antenna has a $10 station holds true today, just as it did years ago. It's never gonna change uh, unless you're just living your life on the internet. It's too easy to get caught up with flashy radios and lots of buttons and knobs and stuff. Uh, I know, <laughs> I, I am guilty of that uh, like anybody. Uh, and over the years have been caught up with that. Since everything starts with our antenna, we're gonna start our station builds at the antenna. But first we need to get something to mount the antennas on, right? Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking too. So let's start there. The ideal route to go to support a large number of antennas, clean installation, et cetera, et cetera. Let me try the English now, et cetera, is ideally a tower. Uh, Rome Towers is one of the most recognized brands out there and is pretty much the standard for towers in the amateur community. The two most popular are Rome 25 and Rome 45. I have on my personal station both Rome 25 towers and Rome 45. I prefer the 45 as it's a heavier, uh, it'll support heavier antennas, it's a heavier tower. Uh, Guyin is a little bit less uh, stringent uh, depending on the height, uh, but price is a huge deciding factor. Uh, 10 foot sections of Rome 45 come in new for about $360 a section. And used, you can get them in the $100, $150 range uh, for 10 foot sections. 10 foot sections of Rome 25 come in new at about 175. So you can see there's a vast difference and used for about uh, $50. Uh, my personal rule of thumb is if I'm going up no more than 100 feet, I'm fine with Rome 25. Um, if I'm going over 100, feet, then I prefer a Rome 45. Again, you know, the, the towers can go higher than, than those specs. That's just my personal comfort zone. I like to over-engineer everything. Uh, for smaller budgets, entry-level applications or situations where you're renting a home, etc., cetera, push-up pull is now a perfect solution. And with some creativity, you can get a rotor up there and a beam. Uh, Ask me how I know. Uh, my first uh, first setup uh, when I was uh, setting things up and got my first uh, HF Yagi, I put a uh, rotor on top of a 50-foot push-up pole, uh, ran a couple guide wires off of the uh, rotor itself uh, to keep it from uh, being unstable and put another five-foot mast on top of the rotor and then placed a a four element uh, ten, tri bander uh, antenna for HF on it and uh, everything. So you can do that. The nice thing about uh, 50 foot telescoping mast is it gets you up about 50 feet and you're looking at an outlay for a brand new one of about $204, $205. And you can usually find them used anywhere from $50 to $75 at uh, Hamfest. 
just make sure if you buy a used one, it's not bent. It, it doesn't take very much of a uh, bend to make it almost impossible to raise or lower. So watch for that. And push-up poles is where almost all of us started uh, originally. Uh, another option, but requires drilling and mounting on your roof, but it's a very solid tower, is the Glen Martin Towers. These are uh, heavy duty and come in sizes from as low as three feet, which is basically a, a, a heavy duty tripod, up to 17 feet. Uh, I actually have a 17 foot Glen Martin on my ranch house um, for my primary tower right now. And uh, once we get situated there, we'll be erecting a 140 foot uh, tower, but I will still retain that 17 foot uh, tower. And on top of my house, uh, the 17 feet and another 40 feet uh, to the roof, it's given me some pretty good height and it's a very stable tower. It's been up there in a lot of heavy winds and everything. And the nice thing about them is they're just like a regular tower. They can support rotors, good size mast and everything else. All right, now that we've covered the basics of where to mount your antennas, let's start looking at some of our options. Here is one awesome fact for you. All right, you ready? There are <laughs> as many antenna options as there are people wanting antennas. We're gonna cover everything from commercial antennas, from high end to mid range. And we're also going to address homebrew antennas that are not only easy to make, but very economical and budget friendly. Our goal with this is to help you build a station, no matter what your budget or expertise level that you can be proud of, and most importantly, have fun with. Because I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in a hobby, it's for fun <laughs> and uh, everything. I think sometimes we take things a little too serious in, in life. Why do I focus so strongly on simplex or weak signal operation? Which is antenna to antenna without passing through internet or repeaters. So I wanna kind of clarify that. Simplex and both single sideband CW weak signal operating is station to station. We're not going through a repeater. We're not passing through the internet, etc. Okay. Simply put, in a need to communicate during an emergency, for example, uh, there's a strong potential for repeaters to be down. The internet may be down. So having a station that can reach out and touch someone is vital. So, you know, that's from a practical standpoint. But for me, it's also a matter of pride. If I'm sitting here at my station in San Antonio and I work a station in Ohio via linked repeater, I may have a really enjoyable chat with someone, but I have no pride in my contact. It was just an internet contact. I didn't even need a ham license to do that. I could have just Skyped them you know, or gotten on a Zoom call. Uh, I feel no sense of accomplishment. And for me personally and, and stuff, uh, where I come from is I like the challenges. I love the challenge. That's why I am such a fanatic when it comes to VHF, UHF operating, because I like the challenges. It's a challenge to work a uh, station in Florida, for example, from my QTH in San Antonio uh, on 23 centimeters with 10 watts and a 55 element Yagi. And we've done it. Uh, for me personally, it's all about pushing the limits of my station capabilities to perform. I can tell you when I made my first contact, we'll get a little sidetracked here, uh, from my station in San Antonio to a station in Florida on 23 centimeters, 1296.100 megahertz, with 10 watts, I was excited as a, as a school girl. But girl, I can't talk today. Uh, school girl. My wife was not the most appreciative person because I burst into our bedroom at 5 a.m. to inform her of my wonderful accomplishment. Um, 
she wasn't as excited for me <laughs> as, as I would like, uh, but probably being woke up uh, at 5 a.m. abruptly uh, had a lot to do with that. Because of my passion and excitement, I just want to share that with others. Just to put it in perspective, from my station, which is not in an ideal location, I've worked FM simplex 80 to 140 miles on a regular basis. Uh, with conditions, I've worked over 500 miles, and I have even accomplished a 700 plus mile contact on FM simplex to Florida twice. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's some strong potential there. But my day to day operating is 80 to 140 miles. Uh, with just a little bit of morning enhancement and stuff. On two meter single sideband, my daily activity is in the 160 to 240 mile range. I can make those kind of contacts every day of the week, pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there are exceptions when the band just tanks, but under normal conditions with that, I'm, I'm operating 160, 240 miles a day. Um, for example, I can work Dale, KA5YEU in Alice, Texas. He's 168 miles away from me. On FM, the only time we can work each other on FM Simplex is when we have a good band opening. All right, we've got a lot of enhancement to our, our signals. On single sideband, him and I can talk anytime we pick up the microphone and call each other. Uh, so that'll give you an example. Uh, with conditions, my record is 1,437 miles on single sideband two meters. All right, to me, this is exciting. Uh, that, that's what I live for. <laughs> and I want you to be as excited as I am the first time you do it. So let's get started on the antenna now. Since most of you guys are gonna be operating FM, we'll make our initial focus start right there, okay? First off, the standard for FM contacts is vertical polarization. This was primarily set uh, as a standard to accommodate mobile communications, mobile antennas. Uh, antenna polarization is extremely important for you, whether you're operating horizontal or vertical. If one station's horizontal and the other is vertical, you start off with a huge impact on your station contact with a 20 dB attenuation on your signal. Not the way to make those fun contacts. You've already wiped out most of uh, everything you've uh, gone for. So you want to have, whether you're operating sideband or FM, you want to have the proper antenna polarization. FM, the standard in the hobby is vertical. On single sideband, CW, the standard is horizontal, okay? So keep that in mind as we move on. So since we're assuming FM right now, let's look at some options. First off, always get an antenna rated as much power as you can. Because while today you may only be running 25 to 50 watts, tomorrow you may want a lot more. So buy equipment that supports you in the future rather than spending money to buy things twice, okay? I'll start off this antenna topic with my personal opinion and choice. I always prefer, number one, to run mono band antennas. I hate to have any part of my station compromise. So I want it focused on doing one job at one time. I do not like jacks of all trades, master of none. So, and I'm this way through my radios and, and, and almost every other aspect as you'll find out as we move down the list. So with this in mind for an omnidirectional antenna for FM operation, my antenna of choice is the Hustler G7-144. This is a very strong performing antenna with a typical gain of 6.9 dB, and it can handle up to 600 watts, okay? And is one of the pricier options at uh, $209. My personal opinion, if you do not need a dual band antenna due to the radio you're running, 
this is the way to go. In the future, it'll handle decent power if you feel the need to add an amp for FM, but don't jump on an amp right now. That's the last thing you want to put in your shack. Uh, you want one, but it needs to be the last thing you do. Uh, let's maximize your station and then look at enhancements. All right. Uh, so you want a quality design and build that's going to provide you with years of satisfaction. The G7 144 made by Hustler will do that. If you must use a dual band antenna due to your radio type or limits on being able to mount multiple antennas, you know, not everybody can put three, four towers up. So you may only be able to put one antenna up and you want both. Um, my first choice uh, on there would be the Comet GP9. This is a very tall antenna. It's, it comes in at over 18 feet and its max power handling is 200 watts, which honestly should be fine for 90% of your simplex operation. It offers 8.5 dBi gain on VHF and on UHF it's spec at 11.9 dBi. It's the prices of the vertical Omnis, uh, that comes in, it's, it, it's the most expensive of all of the antennas we're going to discuss for vertical operation. Uh, and it comes in at $220. Uh, but it is a good investment if you've got to have a dual band antenna and you're going to be happy with it. It's, it performs well. Uh, in my opinion, this antenna and the tram are both pretty equal, uh, but different price range and, and capabilities and quality build. Uh, but I find uh, the tram has its good points, but it's a lot less expensive. Another solid performer, but more budget friendly, a pr uh, friendly price is the tram 1481. Stay away from the 1480, you're gonna be disappointed. 1481 is another dual band antenna with 8 dBi VHF and 11 dBi on VHF. It is also rated at 200 watts, but unlike the Comet, which uses an N connector, this uses a, a UHF connector, okay? Uh, it's also had some issues in the past with water building up and causing uh, antenna failure, high SWRs and everything, but most of those issues have been resolved uh, over the years. And uh, there are several helpful hint places and we can provide information if anybody needs it on some tips to uh, ensure you don't have any water issues in it. Uh, like all VHF antennas, you want it as high as you can possibly get it within reason. As eventually your feed line loss will destroy any gain you accomplish with height. So there's trade-offs there. But as a rule, something I consider very, very important, and I'm, I cannot stress this often enough or hard enough, you should always focus on getting your antennas above the trees. As we climb in frequency, this becomes even more important. At two meters and 1.25 meters, a typical tree is going to create approximately 5 dB of attenuation kind of just destroyed what we gained by using a high gain antenna. You might as well put up a J pole. Okay, so let's, let's uh, get above the trees. And next month, we're gonna be focusing on loss and how much it impacts your station as we do feed line and everything. Ideally, let's get about 15, 10 to 15 feet above the trees with the base of your antenna. This is gonna clear your tree canopy issues for your station. In my area, I'm dealing with 35 to 40 foot trees. So a 50 foot tower push up pull is sufficient for me. For other amateurs and other areas, well, not so much, especially if you live around a pine forest or something, uh, those suckers can get pretty tall. Uh, with either of the three Omni verticals, if you can get it over the trees or to as thin of a spot in the tree canopy as possible, you'll be enjoying some good operation. But try to always get your antennas above the treetops. Uh, the higher above the trees, the better you'll be.
Now, if you get hooked on making those simplex DX contacts, we're hoping you'll get more excited about uh, wanting more gain and uh, wanting a little bit more improvement on your station. So let's look at the other option, Yaggies, okay? They're not just for sideband or HF. They also uh, play a good role in uh, uh, simplex uh, operation and even long distance repeaters uh, for those that just can't get away from repeaters. Um, my personal opinion is 10 elements or greater for FM operation. Here we've got a lot of op options. Let's start at the most economical, a homebrew quad design antenna. Uh, you can see the one pictured right here. This particular antenna was designed and built by KC5 ULU out of San Antonio, a fellow hamster member. The antenna can be tuned and positioned for either vertical or horizontal polarization. And he has, he actually runs two of them at his uh, QTH with one set up vertical and one set up uh, horizontal. A huge advantage to quads is the ease to build one. I mean, they're easy to build. Uh, also per element, they have more gain than a Yagi. Okay, a five element quad is gonna perform up there with a 10 to 12 element Yagi, uh, typical. Okay, uh, there are exceptions again. Uh, the big benefit here is a much shorter boom, which helps in tight quarters or with wind loading and also in stacking. Uh, the antenna that D's design provides right at about 12 dBi gain. Okay, so it, it does good and uh, we've used it uh, to do some testing. It's lightweight. Uh, in the picture that I, I put up of his uh, design, that actually was mounted on a uh, uh, painter's pole on a deck of a rental apartment uh, or cottage in, uh, at the coast. And uh, it's like 35 feet off the ground uh, with the uh, deck and everything. And uh, him and I worked each other. We were about 320 miles uh, from his location to mine when he was at the uh, cottage. And uh, we work each other on single slide band with absolutely no problem. Uh, so the antenna performed well, it had good gain and we had good signal. Uh, homebrew quad, this particular, I just said that. <laughs> I back myself right up into a corner there. Uh, this antenna offers about 12 dBi, like I said. Now, here's the good news for those of you that don't want to build an antenna or you want something that's heavy duty commercial construction, Innovana Antennas is the place to go. Um, and you can see here uh, their quad, again, it can be mounted horizontal or vertical and tuned for, for horizontal or vertical uh, frequencies and everything. Uh, Innovon antennas, I highly recommend. I've been running their LFA Yaggies and I actually have uh, three of the seven element quads on order right now. Uh, two for two meters and one for uh, 220. And I will be uh, stacking the two meters for gain and the 220 I'll be running as a single unit uh, at this time. Eventually, I probably will put a second uh, quad in place, okay, uh, for stacking on 220 as well. Uh, so my personal station will be running a stack set of seven element LFA quads from in Innovana antennas. Uh, they're an LK or UK uh, company, and uh, they provide 13.6 dBi gain, and then an additional 3 dB by stacking the two. And we'll be covering more on stacking in a few minutes here uh, with our conversation. Gain is important and can play a huge role for you. Keep in mind on transmit, you can always add more power going from 50 to 100 watts or 100 watts to 200 watts, et cetera, will resolve many issues on your transmit side. But if your antenna system's not properly gained and your station's not 
uh, properly matched and feed line losses and everything where you can't hear all the power on transmit in the world will not help you at all. Very important, amps should be one of the last devices. Remember I said this already, uh, you add to your station. Balance your station for transmit and receive. Nothing is more frustrating to you as an operator and other stations uh, to be hearing you, but not able to be heard, okay? We want to hear as clearly as we can be heard now, the next part is simply my personal opinion and recommendation. If you're building an FM simplex station, I would recommend a 10 to 13 element Yagi. If you're building a CW to single sideband station, I would recommend a 13 to 17 element. Both of those setups are going to give you good balance, uh, good reception, good transmission off your baseline radio. All right. Now, let's take a look and see how we can add more gain to our antenna system. All right, let's get into stacking. Stacking your antenna is putting additional antennas in phase to increase the gain. There are two ways to stack your antennas. Stacked vertically, one over the other, common for single sideband CW operation, um, and stacked horizontally, common for FM. When you stack your antennas vertically, one over the other, you're gonna increase your gain, but the pattern's gonna remain very similar to the single Yagi gain. So uh, typical, you're gonna have about a 25 to 30 uh, bandwidth uh, pattern and stuff so that you're, you've got a, about a 25 to 30 degree spread on there. So. What that means is when you're pointed at somebody, you don't have to be 100% on them. You're gonna get some give and take. And then once you make a contact, you can fine tune to bring them in the, the best you want. Um, if you stack your antennas horizontally side by side, you're going to increase the gain of the antenna the same as your horizontal stacking. However, your pattern is going to change the beam width is going to narrow by almost 50%. So that 30 uh, degree pattern is now a 15 degree pattern, okay? Uh, so what you just did is, uh, while that may not sound like a lot, you just turned your antenna system into a laser pointer, okay? And what that means is if you're not almost dead on a station, you're not gonna hear them and they're not gonna hear you. Uh, so you want to keep that pattern in with the manufacturer's recommendation. So stack it uh, properly. Uh, if you stack horizontally and narrow that beam width, you turn your beams, like I said, into a laser pointer. Um, let's avoid laser pointers, okay? Let's discuss actual stacking. There are two more concepts to stacking identical band antennas. Whether you're stacking for gain or stacking different bands, when stacking same band antennas for gain, follow the manufacturer's spec on spacing and fine tune for minimum SWR. If the manufacturer does not provide specs or it's a homebrew antenna, use your boom length as a baseline, closing the spacing between the antennas for minimum SWR. So if you got a 10 foot boom on your antenna, start at 10 foot and then start working your down to tune uh, your, your signal with them. And also when you're stacking, always remember there are two ways to connect the antennas and phase them, all right? Uh, the common method is, because it's economical, is to use a T connector and equal length of 75 ohm cable, all right? So if the cable going from the T to your lower antenna is 10 feet, one inch, the cable going from the T to the upper antenna needs to be 10 feet, one inch exactly as well, okay? If they're different lengths, you're throwing things out of phase and you're gonna be a real unhappy person. Uh, the other method of uh, stacking them is, and phasing them is to use a power divider. Now, this is my personal choice. 
because then I continue with the uh, very low loss feed line uh, going up and it's 50 ohms. So I don't have to go and find 75 ohm cable uh, connectors and things like that. It, I, I run what I got. Uh, again, make sure it's exact same length down to the, the millimeter there. Okay, you want to stay. Um, on my 15 element Yaggies that I ran for the last 10 plus years, uh, they required a 12.2 foot separation for stacking properly for gain. One of the driving factors to my switching to the quads, even though I was going to see a slight loss in overall gain, I had more workable situation because I only have eight and a half feet of separation. So as with everything, there are trade-offs, okay? Got a little less gain. I'll, I'll be missing about three dBi gain compared to my 15 elements, but a lot less wind loading and a lot less mass, vertical mass required, okay? Uh, when stacking antennas at different bands, you want to separate enough distance to move the antennas out of the pattern of each other, okay? Uh, always start with the lower band on the bottom and work your way up. Um, a typical rule of thumb for spacing uh, your antennas is one half the recommended distance for stacking similar band antennas for gain. OK, so in the case of uh, of uh, let's say you got a 13 element two meter Yagi that requires 11 feet separation, then stacking dissimilar antennas, you'd be looking at 5.5 feet in a perfect world. So for a six meter antenna, you would stack the two meter above it 5.5 feet, then put your 432 antenna, which would be about three and a half feet, okay? Uh, depending again on the size and, and stuff of the antenna. Unfortunately, <laughs> how many of us get to live in a perfect world? I sure in the heck never do. So by reducing that by almost half again to about three feet, so we went from 5.5 feet to now we're going to three feet, you're still gonna get acceptable results, but the pattern for the six meter antenna is gonna be minor reduction in performance. Okay, it will be take a slight hit, but it's not gonna be enough that most people will even notice it. The two meter antenna, however, is really not gonna see any impact on its performance. So let's take a look at a real world situation, okay? As many of you guys are aware, uh, about a month and a half ago, we had a big windstorm come in and after 53 years in the hobby, life finally caught up with Greg. Uh, and I had a mass collapse on my tall tower and I'm now rebuilding my antenna system. Uh, because learning from past mistakes, I wanna limit my mass length. I'm actually going with an H frame set. Uh, three feet, sorry about that. Uh, three feet above my tower my six meter antenna is gonna be mounted. Then we're gonna go six feet up above that antenna with my H-frame. The H-frame has a horizontal separation uh, from vertical mass to vertical mass of nine feet. And then both of my vertical sections are nine feet. It's designed to mount my four or four of my seven element quads that I've got on order uh, for two meters. However, I'm only gonna stack two of them, all right? So what I'm doing on the left side of my H frame, and you can look at the diagram I drew here and see, we'll have two quads stacked for gain vertically over each other with 8.5 feet separation. On the right side of my frame, I'm gonna put my 23 centimeter uh, loop Yagi, and down at the bottom of that uh, vertical mast, I will put, uh, my uh, 21 element 432 LFA Yagi. okay? This allows me to stack two antennas for two meters and still mount 23 centimeter and 70 centimeter Yaggies without having a 20 foot plus mast. Uh, because otherwise, let's see, we would have our six meter antenna, 
we would need, uh, those are eight feet. So we would need uh, right at uh, four and a half feet separation between the six meter and my lower two meter, then eight feet, then approximately uh, three and a half to four feet for my 432. And then about another three feet for my 23 centimeter. That's one tall mast. And uh, that's when you start having structural issues and everything. I got away with it. I, I, I can't believe how long I got away with uh, my situation, but like everything, it finally caught up with me. Okay. So I'm only using my new design as an example of how you can think outside the box to allow additional level of flexibility in building your station. As I said at the start of this presentation, the antenna is where we all start our station building, or we should. Uh, unfortunately, 90% of the people started at the radio, okay? I like to come down. And uh, next month, we're gonna focus on connecting our antennas to our radios. And then following month, we'll get to discuss the real fun stuff, the radio. Uh, all right, well, this is N5XO. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this initial presentation on antennas as uh, segment one of our station building. And uh, we'll see you next month on that. Let's go back to the rest of the guru now. Greg, that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Your sincerity is overwhelming. <laughs> Look, I spent like five whole minutes in earlier in this episode saying just how much grief I give you, okay? If I don't give you grief, we are breaking a tradition. <laughs> That's true. Look, y'all contribute all the technical stuff. I contribute this, okay? <laughs> Somehow or another, we appreciate it. <laughs> do my best <laughs> do my best it lets me get all of the honoriness out that i'm not allowed to do at work <laughs> well i'm happy to do my part for you <laughs> so that was such an amazing segment greg <laughs> as you guys can tell most of the time all of our together segment is put together prior to or separate from our individual segments. So honestly, I have no idea what Greg's segment was like. We're just going to be honest here, but it's my job to bring him back because he tends to ramble. So, <laughs> so we're back <laughs> from Greg's segment. Great job. I'll just assume you did a great job. How's that? See, that should be giving you credit. That's fair enough. There you go. See? See, it's nice. It's a compliment. Just yeah. take it and be happy. <laughs> I shall log this on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and now off to my segment, which is, I'm guessing, at least going to be informative if it's not fun, because uh, trust me, I promise you, you've seen the list. I have fun things planned. Uh, most of my stuff has gone straight into the emergency communication stuff because that's what I live day in and day out. I will say that I do have a little secret bit of news for everybody. Um, my husband runs our damn amateur radio club with me, of course. And one of the things that he has put forth that he wants to get activated this year is more dams. So just like we activate parks for parks on the air, we will be activating more dams this year. So if you want to start collecting those, then stay tuned to damark.org, which is D-A-M-A-R-K.org. Greg will put it in the box below, Greg, make a note. <laughs> or it's me, she is to me. She wants me to do her favor now. You Luckily, get I'm out every time you don't put any of the links down below, like I say you're going to do. <laughs> so we're pretty excited that we're finally going to get a chance to go back to doing um, the activations at the dams and taking the pictures and sending out the certificates and all the things that we actually have fun doing because most of my life has been eat up by emergency management right now. <laughs> so 
I'm pretty excited. I hope that's exciting news for those of you who are out there. If you pay attention, if you watch our podcast and you want to do things like Parks on the Air, but do something a little different, well, we're pretty excited to bring that to you. We're going to have the opportunity to activate, I think, at least four more dams this year. We've already done Truman and we've done um, Palm de Terre. We did those two years ago, I think. So we had a whole break for, I'm not going to say the P word. You guys know what the P word is by now, but we took a break for that. But we're coming back strong. I'm pretty excited about that. So without further ado, here is the segment which answers one of our viewers' questions. <music> Greetings from Camden County. Okay, so I was supposed to film some of the other things that I had lined up for this year, but we had a comment on one of our previous videos where someone asked our opinion, my opinion, I guess, on what do we do if previous emergency coordinators are not happy with the appointment of new emergency coordinators? Oh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. I experienced something similar to that when I became the emergency coordinator of our local Aries group um, in Benton County. So here is something that I think will help greatly. Number one, be patient because a lot of people don't understand that newer or younger people just want to help. They may see that or assume that you just want to push them out. Okay, old timer, your ways are done. We don't have any patience for that. We have newer, better ways of doing things. That's not always true. And a lot of it comes down to ego. Some of it comes down to knowledge base. I think that having the patience and making the outgoing emergency coordinators understand that they are still valued, their knowledge of the intricacies and the workings between the government agencies, the first responder agencies, the emergency uh, communications agencies because there's more than one Aries is not the only game in town so I think that the best thing you can do in my humble opinion is just let them know that you aren't trying to push them out you value their experience you value what they've been through you value what they've done for the county there are a lot of things still in existence in counties I've worked in because even the old ways were better than some of the new ways. Uh, the next piece of advice that I would say on that subject is also take the time to make sure that people understand it's okay to have the opposite true, where sometimes the old ways didn't work and we've come up as we've progressed as human beings, we've come up with better ways to do things or we've come up with technology that makes life easier. It is 100% a great thing to know how things used to be done. It is 100% a great thing to know that. But it's also a 100% great thing to understand that we can continue to get better. We don't have to stagnate. We don't have to, to think our way is the best. A hundred times I'm going to reach out to people who have more experience than me. I don't know how many times I have pestered my own husband going, I don't understand this. Can you break it down for me? That way I can understand it better. If I understand things better, then I can explain it better. So I would say the third piece of advice I have, if you're having a problem butting heads or, or egos are getting bruised when it comes time to replace the outgoing emergency coordinator with an incoming new one, is probably take the time to sit down and actually have a meeting because it was very wham bam thank you ma'am for me and it was jarring. It was shocking because there are so many things you don't know unless the former EC tells you. 
Now, I'd like to pause there or stop there talking about incoming and outgoing ECs because now I'd like to tackle if you're having a problem as an ARIES group or as an, an emergency communications group being taken seriously by first responders. This is a big problem, but I can tell you, at least here in Missouri, it's not as big a problem as it is everywhere else. Almost every county EMD that I work with and have worked with in the last four years has had no problem whatsoever working with their local ARIES group or their local emergency communications group. As long as you first understand that the agency or the organization, whether it be a first responder organization or whether it be an emergency management agency, we have a tremendous amount of pressure and a tremendous amount of rules that are put down on us. So some of the time when we're telling you, no, you can't do that, it's not because we want to be mean to you. <laughs> it's because, frankly, we have a lot of pressure on us to make sure that things go smoothly and things go right. That's our job figure out how to make things go right. One of the things I suggest, because not every EMD is like me, uh, is again, sit down at that meeting and I find it very hard to talk to people who come in assuming I don't know anything. I usually can figure out something to connect new knowledge to that is similar to old knowledge. So if you've got an emergency management director who has any experience whatsoever in first response, because a lot of them are retired first responders, a lot of them are retired military, they're going to have some at least entry level knowledge of the function that you're doing. If you come in puffing the feathers up like I know things and you need me and I'm important, that ego again is going to shoot you right in the foot. I don't know if I can probably say it like that, but I'm going to say it like that. Um, egos are the hardest things that we have to deal with and that's everywhere from the egos that fire chiefs have to deal with and police chiefs and everybody else. We've come into a very me-centered world now. So a lot of our issues, I think, are based in that problem right there. If you go in with more of a, here's what our capabilities are, here is where we might be useful, and here are some examples of how agencies like yours have used us in the past or have used emergency communications groups in the past, I think you're going to get a lot more support, a lot more encouragement, and the doors are going to open for you more. I hope that's been helpful. I'll be back hopefully next month with another topic. Thank you so much for listening to my section of Ham Talk. This is KE0LMY73. Okay, we're back. Since I gave Gr Greg so much grief about bringing him back from the segment, none of them have watched my segment either. So they're going to tell me now how wonderful that segment was. <laughs> that was really I was in awe. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I was shocked. Tongue-tied. We like to have a little bit of fun, guys. This is kind of something that we do. For me, it's getting away from all of the stress of day to day. So this podcast gives me a chance to see Melissa's smiling face and see what Andrea has broken this week and <laughs> <laughs> figure out which dinosaurs Greg is riding to work at this point. You know, all the good stuff. <laughs> see, I got a little something for all y'all. <laughs> But yeah, they haven't watched my podcast either, or my segment either. So don't let them fool you. <laughs> Greg didn't even know that I sent it to him. Okay. <laughs> so we really appreciate all those of you who are hanging with us, maybe having a little bit of fun. This is by no means something where we want you to think that we know everything. We're just sharing some general knowledge that we've picked up over the years, whether it be good or bad. <laughs> I'm just as likely to do a segment on, let me tell you what went wrong. <laughs> hey, actually, that am. could be very helpful. It, it might be. It might be, because I've got a few of those stories. Yeah, about avoid the following. <laughs> like, like, I can tell you how not to clamp down a, a, a mast. Oh, yeah. All right. 
why we guy wire our towers. <laughs> oh, my tower didn't fall. <laughs> it was my mask that gave way. And it was my tower that gave way. Oh. <laughs> you thought I was kidding, but no, I'm serious. <laughs> okay, I wasn't aware of that one. <laughs> And I'm sure Andrea's got at least one she could throw off. You know, what's one that you might have learned the hard way? How not to yeah, pack do radiator. Yeah, I was going to say that one, Greg. Yeah, that's kind of kind of low low hanging fruit there. <laughs> also, I, I can talk about how even if you don't, you know, you're drunk and you're thinking about driving that you're not going to save yourself by getting a room because like final destination you take that off ramp you don't get on the plane and the plane crashes fate's going to come after you and you're going to fall down in the bathtub and crack your ribs anyway yeah that was kind of low-hanging fruit too yeah. <laughs> And then Melissa's the only one of us who's going, uh-uh, I got none. <laughs> well, I don't know. It got kind of exciting putting her antenna up for a little while. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, no, it went Melissa, up smooth, but it, it, you, it was a, uh, it, okay, it offered here you some go. scary here you go, moments. Melissa, do you have a what not to do? Um, no, I mean, I think overall it worked out pretty good. So, yeah. You'll get there. Don't worry. You'll yeah. have some, <laughs> you'll have some terrible well, stories. We what if Greg? I mean, Greg doesn't live too far from me, and we have had some within the last couple of months. Of course, it usually happens in springtime anyway, or coming out of winter. the The winds have been unreal, and so my nerves. I, I just have a single pole, forty feet, and then the seventeen foot antenna up on top of that. And it's, <laughs> yep. so <laughs> I'm running outside watching my guy strings <laughs> going, please hold, please hold. <laughs> I'm sure Greg did a wonderful job. And if he didn't, he'll go fix it. <laughs> well, I will so, tell you in all honesty, the day that my mast buckled, Mm. Uh, we had 78 to 79 mile an hour winds hit us here. Yeah. And it was straight really, line winds took down the yep. tower. It's and my mask buckled it. after, I mean, decades of being up there with no problems. Mm -hmm. My mask said, I'm done. I'm going to bed now. <laughs> and I was, I just knew Melissa was going to call me and tell me her antenna blew down. And uh -huh. we're talking like that was like three days after we put it up. Right. Yeah. And uh, everything. And uh, yeah. happiest day of my life is when she called and said, my antenna survived. <laughs> well, I just well, wanted to say. Hey, well, well, they they are military push-up poles. So, I mean, it's military grade so. stuff. So I just want to say my antenna, my mass survives 90, 95 mile, mile per hour winds regularly. You know what's going to happen now. <laughs> yeah. You did that. Yeah, and it's on video. We'll, we'll be seeing on Facebook Andrea complaining that her antennas blew off the car. <laughs> <clears throat> it's going to hey. happen. <laughs> yes. Well, there's, there's, you know, those, those headwinds and stuff. I'm not going that fast. It's true. Yeah. So as you guys can see, we, we really just try and have a little fun, bring a little joy. There are a lot of terrible things happening in this world right now. There mm -hmm. are a lot of stressful things happening in this world right now. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, Greg and Andrea do a great job bringing all of the technical advice and things like that. I'm hoping Melissa and I, I guess we're the <laughs> comic relief of the show. I'll take it. Hey, if, it, if we can make one person smile, make one person's day a little bit better, then to me, we've done our job. What do you think, Melissa? Yeah. <laughs> Melissa's like, I have done good so far, and I have not stuck my foot in my mouth once this show. <laughs> I, 
I do have a, a, a small announcement. Okay. Um, we've got Hamvention 2022 coming up, first time in three years on May 20th through May 22nd. I will be exhibiting Rover there. And I will also be giving a presentation in the VHF, UHF microwave forums on roving. Good. That's awesome. Well, we unfortunately, this year this. we're not making Dayton because it's our anniversary and it's our 40th anniversary. And my wife has advised me that we're not going to a damn ham fest this year. <laughs> uh, so we're going to take off for Hawaii and and playing the, the oh, fun and fun. Yeah. So that, that's Wait, how that we'll sounds like something that. you should advertise that way. You can do ham contacts from Hawaii. I mean, nothing, dear, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not taking any radios. I'm not doing anything. I am going to devote my time and energy strictly to my wife because in all fairness, she's gone to ham fest four or five times the week of our anniversary because Dayton hi Ruth we love you <laughs> so uh I, I'm gonna be good for our 40th <clears throat> okay he was sweet I guess I won't give him any more grief this episode <laughs> So everybody, we want to thank you so much for just tuning in, hanging in there with us. Yeah, we're still trying to figure out who we are and what we're going to be bringing to you. Yes, those of you who tune in to get the technical stuff, I know that Greg and Andrea are your favorites. Wonderful. I hope that Melissa and I bring some, just some joy and some laughter and just a little bit of, hey, you're not the only one this stuff is happening to when we trip over <laughs> something or go, gee, maybe we should guy wire our tower. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, we, we have to hear more about that. We'll save it for a future episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying that story about we never had to for like 10, 15 years in the past, but then all of a sudden some straight line winds happen. I'm just saying. <laughs> But we would, we would genuinely like to thank you guys from the bottom of our heart. And as we said, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell so you get the notifications. I love being able to say that because all the YouTubers I watch, they're always saying that. And sure, we will too. <laughs> <laughs> and we will try and stay on a better schedule this year. Greg's already cracking the whip, making sure, are, did you get the invite? Did you get it? We're doing it. You're, you got it, right? <laughs> yes i got it <laughs> so thank you once again to our sponsors hamsters week signal group they are amazing everything that they do they really work hard to just enjoy the hobby spread the word everything that andrea does with the roving and being able to do ham radio on the road and prove to you you don't have to stay hooked to your ham shack you can enjoy your hobby anywhere you are Thank you to Melissa because she brings us all of the questions you guys have. You do actually bring us a lot of questions. We fit in as many as we can. Eh, we sometimes we can't get them all in, but you know, just keep submitting them. Put them down below. If we don't answer them in the comments, it might be because we're bringing them onto the show. Keep sending us pictures of your ham shacks because I think Melissa misses that section that she was handling. So please submit your pictures of your ham shacks. We want to see them. And we, she can have her own segment with you. She can ask you some questions, might do an interview, and it'll just spice things up for our show a little bit. Join us next month. I promise something on this list will make it on there because Greg doubts me. <laughs> History's Andrea on might my not side. need a break. Mm -hmm. he, see, this is his fault. We can just blame it on him. But join us next month because we are always going to try and bring you something. We will also try and make it pertinent. There's a lot of things that have been happening around here, including the promise that I gave you of the fact that our amateur radio equipment fell here at the EMA, and I've got to bring you pictures and the repair story on that. <laughs> that was fun. And we just love hearing from you guys. So reach out to us. We love it. 
We want to thank you and say 73 from all of us here. 73. Y'all have a good evening. And thank you for joining us on Ham Talk.